<laughs> so I've thought about this a lot. And I am now convinced that there is no one kind of a person who can become an entrepreneur. A lot of people believe that there are certain characteristics that make someone an entrepreneur and that entrepreneurs are different from non-entrepreneurs or you know, other human beings. So almost <clears throat> as though entrepreneurs are a different species. And I am becoming more and more convinced that that is a very, uh, it's, a, it's not a very useful way of looking at entrepreneurs. I think entrepreneurship is the proverbial ink blot uh, in the sense that you can be a, a, a stick in the mud uh, person with a lot of routine, you know, uh, just for the fun of it, I would say the accountant type, and you could go start H&R Block. Right. Or you could be the ultimate flamboyant uh, guy that you can think of, Richard Branson, and start all kinds of things, including trying to take people to space. So, or you could be a loudmouth like Ted Turner and start CNN. So I actually think I'm con more and more convinced um, that everybody can be an entrepreneur, that entrepreneurship is much more a way of looking at the world and solving problems in the world, like the scientific way, right? Everybody can learn to be a scientist. Not everybody can become an Einstein. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but everybody can actually learn to become more scientific in their reasoning. Uh, and in the same way, I think everybody can become more entrepreneurial in their reasoning. And on top of that, because this involves human beings uh, first and foremost, unlike in science where you have to really understand nature and you know maybe also understand differential equations, uh, here it's much more something that human beings are very good at, interacting uh, with other people in a social setting. And that's why you find millions of women around the world, many of them illiterate, who are entrepreneurs. So uh, I really am becoming more convinced and I'm uh, I'm beginning to embrace the idea that is there is no one type that cannot become an entrepreneur. One is if you never ever start a venture, <laughs> right? You're not going to be a successful entrepreneur. So that's a sure thing. I can separate a successful entrepreneur from the unsuccessful one by seeing whether you ever started anything or not. Uh, the other one, I think, if you want the surest predictor of success is how people actually deal with failure. Uh, so if you think about this, people will argue that the success rate for uh, ventures is very, very small, you know, one in 10. People throw out these numbers. It's actually not quite correct. <clears throat> but uh, whatever the number that you believe is the success rate, uh, if you think about it for a moment, just by being willing to fail once or twice and start again, you can increase the probability of your success irrespective of what the success rate is out there in the world, right? So, so those would be the two things I would look for. Somebody who actually acts, who has a bias for action, so will actually go out and try to solve a problem uh, using entrepreneurial methods, if you will, uh, and someone who is willing to do it over again if they did something wrong. And by doing it over again, there's one other thing that you gain, and that is over time you become very good at keeping your failures small and useful, uh, keeping them smart, making them happen at earlier levels of investment, so you actually are able to get more shots at the pot. So failure teaches you not only what not to do, but also how to do things you know, with a smaller footprint, so if failure happens, it's not disastrous. So, so that's the way I would think about successful versus unsuccessful. This is uh, a, a large part of my research, looks at this uh, notion of what does it mean to think entrepreneurially about a problem, to reason about a problem entrepreneurially, and then most importantly, to act entrepreneurially. So one of the first things about uh, being entrepreneurial is being action-oriented. That you're actually willing to, as I call, do the doable. Uh, so you don't wait for the perfect solution. Uh, so you're always working on version, you know, one point something because you, you've already jumped into version one, 1.0. And that may not be the perfect thing, but you 
kind of always do the doable and then push it and then push it. So that's uh, in terms of action, that's one of the things that entrepreneurs do and that is that they do. Um, and then if you start thinking about what they do, right, then you start beginning to understand a little bit about what does it mean to be entrepreneurial. So one of the things that entrepreneurs are really good at doing, as I told you, especially the experienced ones, is to know to do things in a way that it is not going to involve huge uh, investment outlay. Try to understand how the entrepreneurial worldview is different from other worldviews. Not necessarily from any non-entrepreneurial, but say how is it different from scientific or the religious worldview or maybe a sociological ethos or all these different ways that we could have of looking at the world. The fundamental thing about the entrepreneurial worldview is that you see a role for human action. For example, when you look at where does the future come from, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, even if they may not state it in so many words, they behave as though the future comes from what you and I do, that what human beings do matters. So they do not come from, say, some kind of inevitable trend. You know, there's nothing that is deterministically or even probabilistically written that this is how it is going to go. Whether it is in terms of a new technology, whether it is in terms of uh, uh, where we are headed as human beings, you know, whether it has to do with economic development or the social development of a human being. You take any problem, the entrepreneurial worldview would suggest that what we do matters and that what we do can make a difference. It may not be all that matters, but it's the first thing in a way that matters. That if you do not do something, then nothing will happen. Is something they understand very, very well. So if you try something, you know, you may or may not succeed. But if you do not try something, you know, I can give you a guarantee it ain't going to succeed, right? So it's that kind of a reverse view of success, if you will. A lot of us wait and we think, if, if I think I could succeed at that, I would try it. An entrepreneur just simply says, you know, here is a problem. I kind of know that the first step would work if I take it. And it looks like I can do it. So let me do it and then push it rather than because what I do will make a difference to the odds. So I don't try to calculate all the odds first. Here I would like to give you the example of Mohammed Yunus, um, who started Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. Now, people praise him as some kind of heroic visionary. And actually, he is, you know, my hero in some ways. But I also study uh, early stage entrepreneurship and how a lot of entrepreneurs who have built these very su successful, enduring organizations, how they think. And some of the things you find early on uh, suggest that it was not really the vision that drove them to do they were looking at something much smaller. In fact, when Mohammed Yunus visited Darden, he actually said this. He said, when I was an economist, you know, I thought big. I could see the big picture. I could see the sequence of events and how things would unfold. And you know, I had these general theories of the world and about human behavior. Now I'm an entrepreneur. I have like the worm's eye view. I see very few things, very little things, but I see them very, very clearly. And a lot of entrepreneurs are like that. So they see a little problem that is actually fixable and they fix it. And then that opens up new avenues, perhaps new problems. In Muhammad Yunus's case, uh, he came across uh, this village that was uh, devastated and people had lost their uh, livelihoods. And he finds something, I think he mentioned something like 45 people who required a total of $27 worth of capital. Well, he had $27, he gave it. Um, so that's the first step. But that's not the, the key thing is not just that you and I might have given it to uh, out of just empathy, if you will, or sympathy. Um, but he went the next step. He started asking, if this is so easily fixable, why isn't it fixed already in a big way? So that the next step is the pushing. So he goes to a bank and he actually asks them, why don't you lend these people money? This is, these are really paltry sums. And then they tell him that these people are unbankable, they are poor. And then he pushes that and he pushes that. So if you listen to the story, so it's that first step that you do the doable and then you push. 
and you believe that the pushing is going to make a difference, even though you may not have any guarantee that it will. And I think that is like the essence of the entrepreneurial worldview. Um, if you do not think entrepreneurially, it doesn't mean that you, you're not going to make any difference in the world. So I want to say it's not entrepreneurial versus non-entrepreneurial. You could be a scientist and you could say that I really, people are dying of smallpox and what I really want to do is to solve that problem. And, and that problem obviously is not a question of giving somebody $27 and pushing. Maybe you do need to spend years studying it and working on it. So I, I want to make it very clear that uh, I do not think of the world as entrepreneurial versus non-entrepreneurial. But the essence of the entrepreneurial worldview is this belief that what we do makes a difference and that, and that we can push it and that you keep doing the doable and keep pushing it and you work with a whole bunch of people and get them to work with you in interesting ways, uh, in creative ways and all kinds of good things will happen down the road. So that's the entrepreneurial worldview. Uh, I presented the entrepreneurial worldview fully born, if you will. Um, but in actual fact, I had to understand that by looking at what entrepreneurs actually do in a, in a micro level, if you will. So um, in my research, uh, I talked to a, a, a whole bunch of, uh, you could call them successful entrepreneurs, but success was only a part of their story. I call them expert entrepreneurs. These are people who had several years of founding experience of multiple firms, often success and failures, and they had learned to perform well over time. So they had taken at least one company public. So of course people see them as successful entrepreneurs. And when you study how they think, and I gave them a 17 page problem set of typical startup decisions that all entrepreneurs uh, have to make in starting a company. So I got to see at, at the micro level the kinds of things that they do, uh, not just the whole worldview of how they think, but how they implement that worldview in, in their practical day-to-day -day business problem solving, if you will. And I found a series of things that they do. Uh, and I wrote about five uh, of these, the five principles uh, in my book, but I suspect there are more. Uh, and I think uh, as I teach and I look at more uh, histories of entrepreneurs and I talk to them, I think there will be more. So I don't want to talk about this, that these are there are only five principles, but I can give you some examples. So one of the things I always talk about to my students and uh, is, is about cooking. <clears throat> now I say there are at least two ways of cooking. One is to start with a a dish that you want to make and where you have a great recipe, you go get the ingredients and then you know you make the dish. The other way, the way most of us cook, I think, is we stumble into the ref uh, into the kitchen, open the refrigerator, and find stuff. And if you come into my house, you'll find, you know, things brown powders that you might have the smell to know what it is in them because I make Indian food. Uh, and then, so you kind of look at what you have and then you try to make something with it. The interesting question here is, what difference does it make? whether you cook using a recipe and proper ingredients or whether you stumble into the kitchen and cook something. Um, it, uh, it depends on how good a cook you are, you know, what you end up cooking. Uh, so you can't get away from the basic ideas that you need to understand about running a business. So you still need to know how to manage your cash flow and things like that. But when you just stumble into the kitchen and cook, what happens is, assuming you know how to cook and you're a good cook, you're much more likely to come up with a new dish that even you might not have actually planned to make. Uh, whereas if you're cooking from a recipe, it would be, uh, you would get that dish, right? You wouldn't get some uh, new dish. And that's the interesting part of it. So it's not really a question of this is better than that. It is just that the way entrepreneurs do it, they work with what they have. Uh, and they look around and say, what can I do with this? And then what else can I do with it? So it goes back to the idea of doing the doable and then pushing it. So they just look around at the resources that are available to them. And by, by resources, I don't even mean money. A lot of the entrepreneurs I studied start with things like who I am, what I know, and whom I know. So they're looking at what kind of a person, person am I? What kinds of things turn me on? What kind of things, you know, that, that I just will not do because it goes against my values. So they have a sense of self. Uh, they know what they know, and very often they're very good at knowing what they don't know. 
uh, so they look at what they know and don't know and they look at the people that they know and they uh, start talking to the people almost immediately and they bring them on board very early on so they work with what they have to create something new so that's the technique and there are lots of um, uh, techniques connected with that that we can learn and teach and it's very useful in the classroom the second thing that they're very good at doing is to think through in deciding what to do with what you have uh, they're not really thinking about where you know will I get the biggest bang for the buck you know which one is likely to lead me to the most profit instead they constantly ask themselves you know would I do this even if I know I'm going to lose what I'm investing in it which is a very different criterion uh, financially speaking for example and I call that the affordable loss criterion and a great example of that is uh, you know there are people who have good jobs right pays 100,000 200,000 a year who leave and start a company now the standard gut reaction is to say oh my god they are you know entrepreneurs are risk takers they are just risk loving you know they like jumping off buildings or whatever um, but in actual fact when you look at how a lot of these entrepreneurs uh, make decision especially the experienced ones they're not really saying you know what i'm making 200,000 today but i believe if i do this i will make 20 million and therefore you know i'm just going to invest everything i have that's not the way they think about it at all they think you know what this looks like an interesting thing to do. I think I would enjoy doing it. I've always wanted to do this kind of thing. Um, so I think I can put 50,000 into it and six months of my life. What's the worst that will happen? Maybe, you know, uh, I have left the job and I'm back on the job market and maybe I don't make 200,000, I make 150,000. But if I don't do it now, when will I ever do it? I've always wanted to be my own boss or I've always wanted to build a heart monitor because my dad, you know, died of a heart. Whatever the, that thing is that is moving them, it comes from who they are and what they know and whom they know. It's very close to uh, what they already have on hand. So that's kind of the second thing. And the third and most important thing is that they work with people. Uh, and they work with people in a very interesting way. They don't go and say, you know, here's something I want to build, you know, Gadget G. And this Gadget G is going to change the world. So who do I need to bring on board? And I go and sell this and I'm so good at, you know, I'm so charismatic. I'm such a good salesperson. I bring people on board. No, no, no. What they really do is they are very good at getting you to tell them, you know, what would you want to do with Gadget G? They allow you to change their vision of Gadget G if you are willing to put skin in the game. So they build this network of stakeholders who actually put stake in the ground. And each of them, you know, invests only what they can afford to lose. So the affordable loss works with this stakeholder thing in a very interesting way. So what happens is since each person is putting real skin in the game and they're deciding what to put in based on something they care about so much that they're willing to lose. So the affordable loss does two things. On the one hand, if you fail, it keeps failures really small, something I talked about earlier. But on the other hand, it gives you a different way to evaluate an opportunity, a different way that does not depend entirely only on profits that you would do this for some reason, some reason that you have, even if you lose the money, you would do it, whatever that motivation may be. Uh, it could be something as simple as I can't stand my boss and I just want to. It could be something as simple as that or it could be very lofty saying that, you know, I really wanted to help women back home and I want to do this venture because it would help them and it's okay in the process I try and fail. So the motivation can be anything, but the logic is kind of the same in each case. I used to guess this question <laughs> a lot in the beginning. Um, not so much uh, anymore because I think uh, pretty much, um, at least academically speaking, people are coming around to the idea that entrepreneurship is teachable. Uh, now the question of whether this logic is teachable, I think this logic is even more teachable in the sense that it doesn't depend on any particular set of criteria. So I don't have to give you some kind of psychological test and say, you know, here are three things you need to change about yourself before you can be an entrepreneur. Um, so I tell uh, my students, uh, it's something like a voice and my teaching you to sing. 
there are aspects to it. You have to want to do it. If you never ever want to start a venture, uh, I'm not going to go try to motivate you to start a venture. It's not about that kind of thing. But given that you want to start a venture, there are lots of things that are teachable. There are lots of basic techniques uh, like cash flow that you can teach. But I think I'm very fortunate uh, to have found something that is teachable also at the worldview level. So there are ways to uh, teach people to think differently, just like you can teach people to think scientifically. It doesn't mean they're you know, not going to uh, you know, refuse to uh, walk under a ladder. It doesn't mean that they all become some kind of super rationalist like Newton. But everybody can pause and think, but let me look at that scientifically. You know, Maybe I shouldn't be superstitious. And that's teachable. I think it's in that sense, entrepreneurial thinking or this logic of entrepreneurship is very much teachable. I can't force people to actually get out and do something, but if they want to do something, I think there are lots of things uh, that we can teach them about how to do it better uh, that is more likely to lead to novelty. It's more likely to lead to a more satisfying kind of entrepreneurship, if you will. So there are lots of things that are teachable. Assuming people actually want to learn uh, how to start a venture, one of the first things I tell them is, start it. Uh, and so people look at me like, what? Uh, <laughs> but the, the thing is, I ask them, OK, so you want to start a venture. What venture do you want to start? And people would say things like, oh, I want to start a venture, but I don't have an idea. Uh, or, you know, I have an idea, but I don't have money. So I try to go through that list and take away their reasons for not doing it. And it's very uh, easy to do that because you can come up with examples of entrepreneurs uh, over and over again who did things without having an idea and without having any resources and with four kids uh, after a divorce which didn't give you any money. I mean, there are examples of entrepreneurs uh, who have done it every which way that you can imagine. And almost all the time when people think about, here are three things that you need before you start a venture, almost all of them are always falsified in most great entrepreneurial uh, stories. So I have lots of stories if you would like me to go into one or two of them. Uh, so one of the stories is uh, Google, right? Now we think it's like the greatest uh, idea in the whole universe. But when Google came along, it was just another search engine. There were, I don't remember how many exactly. There were like 65 viable search engines on the market, something like that. It was yet another search engine. Maybe a couple of you know tech-savvy people in Silicon Valley knew that there was something special about it. Uh, but when their first investor actually gave them a check, they didn't have a bank account. They hadn't incorporated. He gave a check on Google Inc. and then they had to open a bank account later. So even they did not really you know, believe that this is going to be the greatest thing. In fact, there is a story that they tried to sell the company for $1 million and you know, luckily, I say for them, nobody was, <laughs> there were no takers, so they couldn't sell it. So they had to, you know, perforce become billionaires. That does not sound to me like somebody who had this great vision for a good idea. Another uh, example is Pierre Omidyar, uh, and he gave a convocation talk at Tufts where he describes this. That people always tell me that you must have known that eBay. Uh, had to be self-sustaining, otherwise it couldn't, you know, manage with 40 million users a day or whatever it was at that time. And he said, no, uh, I built a system that would be self-sustaining because, you know, I had a life then. <laughs> so that, this Google, you know, eBay was not my uh, only uh, thing. I had a day job, I had a girlfriend, and we wanted to go mountain biking on the weekends. Uh, and so I had to build something that would just capture feedback and do everything on its own while we were away having a life. Uh, and he goes on to say that if I had gotten in a lot of money from a venture capital capitalist, I might have done something more complicated and it wouldn't have worked the way eBay has worked out. Uh, so here's another person. But it doesn't mean that they have no ideas. They're just doing things that they know how to do, and they're trying to push it. He, he's, he has a day job, but he's trying to build something, uh, build a venture on the side, too. Uh, so you can uh, talk about these things, people having ideas, resources. Uh, and I also show video clips in class. Robert Rice, who founded r and uh, um, they, uh, uh, they sold Trivial Pursuit in the millions, right? Uh, so he talks about it, and he has a very good way. He says uh, that it's like playing Scrabble. 
a lot of people think that you have to have some kind of a blockbuster idea. I'm actually quoting him now, by the way. Uh, but he says it's like Scrabble. You know, it's, most ideas are mundane. You add a letter to a word, and then you get the credit for the whole word. You know, uh, so I so I play that clip in class, and I talk about that a little bit. And there are a whole series of exercises that you can do. Uh, and one of them is I ask students to think about who they are, what they know, and whom they know, and to come up with a couple of possible venture ideas that they can start the next day. And then if nothing else, I tell them do something every day about it. I mean, it could be something as, as simple as coming up with a name and getting a card printed. So, so long as you actually do something, it becomes real somehow. And then people start doing things. And then I get them to call um, uh, people and talk to them, get advice, and then all kinds of advice starts pouring in. You should do this, you should not do that, and you know you should make it bigger, it should be like this, maybe you should add this chip, or you should look at this technology. And then they start getting all this feedback, and a lot of people even start picking up the phone and calling other people to introduce them, and very soon it becomes very, very real. So there's absolutely no substitute, I think, um, to actually getting people to start a venture. Even if starting a venture might be something as uh, it might seem idiotic, like, you know, come up with a name and print a card. Uh, it could be the starting point. But then the pushing is where I think the real learning happens. So what do you do next, I think, is the essence of entrepreneurial teaching. So the first step is to get them to do something. And then you start look, looking into this problem of what do you do next. Uh, so in a way, I almost uh, think about entrepreneurship now uh, in terms of content and teaching as the art of the next step that entrepreneurs are always about the next step. Because a lot of people do you know, come up with an idea and a name and a business card and then they stop. Uh, whereas entrepreneurs are very good at going out and talking to people and then responding to all the suggestions and sometimes even the criticisms that they get with always another action that is doable and worth doing in the small. And then they push it and then they push it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, if, in fact, if we have to come off the reception, who's going to get us out of it? <laughs> if entrepreneurs stay home and wait for the recession to end, right? The, the worldview in entrepreneurship is what you do matters. And if you don't do anything, uh, it is not going to change. So when things don't go well, it's even more the time to act. That's part of the uh, entrepreneurial worldview. And uh, uh, this is something uh, that's that seems very simple when you actually come to realize it, but it's not uh, intuitive uh, to think about. Now, there are lots of articles written and stories about companies that started during recession. But one of the things people haven't written about as much is the idea that there are more opportunities where there are problems. For example, there are more opportunities today, I would bet, in sub-Saharan Africa than any place else, just because that place needs so much. Because uh, you know, it's, it's simple economics that w w where, where, where does demand come from? It comes from needs, it comes from necessities, it comes from wants, it comes from uh, uh, people who have problems. And that's where opportunities come from. I had a student from Nigeria uh, uh, who took a class with me in the first year and he had the same issue that a lot of my students have. Oh, I would love to be an entrepreneur someday, but you know, I don't have any idea. I don't think I'm the entrepreneur type. Uh, and by the time we finished with the course and we had talked about this notion that ideas are dime a dozen, opportunities are strewn everywhere, what makes something really a viable opportunity is you're acting on it and you, you're finding ways to kind of implement it. By the time we had done with it, I think he was ready to at least try something. So he goes back to Nigeria uh, during the holidays. And then he comes back with a book of like 20 ideas, all of which he absolutely are doable and he wants to do now. <laughs> right? And so the problem became, you know, kind of the what to do next or rather what not to do next because you cannot do all 20 at once. Uh, so from a person who thought that he didn't have an idea and that opportunities are rare, he suddenly realized that he could see a lot of opportunities and he could see a lot of opportunities back home where everything was new. Uh, I have kind of the same experience when I go back to India. Everything uh, is is new there in some ways. And the excitement uh, of development is exactly that. 
that is a basic level, of course, if you are in the bottom billion or if you're really, really poor that you do not have food to eat. That's a different story. But the moment we come out of that absolute basic necessity out of life, almost immediately life is filled with opportunities because now the human being has time to think and actually do something and human beings create things and human beings start wanting things, which is a very good thing. So I do believe that uh, the environment for opportunities has to be, if there is a measure of it, higher today during a recession than when we had all that money floating, floating around uh, uh, on Wall Street. And just to give you one example, uh, one of the classic examples of a company that started during a recession is Sony. And uh, Sony started during uh, um, the recession in Japan and they started trying to make uh, rice cookers <laughs> and, and it, it's amazing. Apparently, if you go to Sony headquarters today, they still have these uh, uh, steamers uh, on the wall because that's what, that was the original business model for the company. So it goes to everything that we say. A, you can start a company like Sony during a recession. And B, you don't need to know what the heck it's going to be. <laughs> it could be you know, a bunch of steaming baskets and it turns out to be something uh, you know, very different down the road. This is a tougher question for me to answer because I'm not really an expert in this area. But there are lots of examples of people being entrepreneurial within a company. And there are a lot of companies that actively try to encourage people to be entrepreneurial within a company. One of my colleagues uh, and um, uh, a, a co-author of mine also, there were three or four people from Darden involved, Jean Leitka and Rob Wildbank and um, Sean Carr and a couple of other people who actually looked at organic growth leaders, people who had created top line growth within companies. And they found that uh, at least uh, to some substantial extent, they think like expert entrepreneurs. So there's a lot of overlap between how expert entrepreneurs think and or how organic growth leaders inside larger corporations think. They also have to incorporate other kinds of mechanisms. For example, they have to know how to navigate uh, the system within the corporation. So it's not a one-on-one -on -one match, but there is uh, some evidence, some recent evidence that shows that. But there's a lot of other kinds of stories of entrepreneurs within companies. So I'm not sure that it cannot be done. Uh, but it would be interesting to see uh, what are some of the barriers uh, to entrepreneurial thinking, whether within a large corporation or in a country, for example. So that would be a topic I think that would be really interesting to look at. What comes in the way uh, of people trying to be entrepreneurial in companies? And there are other people who study that too. But I'm not quite an expert on that. Um, but given what I have actually looked at uh, in terms of uh, tr people trying to be entrepreneurs within a company, one of the reasons is almost every decision on that what to do next question inside a company involves some kind of a trade-off that uh, an independent entrepreneur may not have. For example, if I decide as an entrepreneur within a company, I want to develop uh, the, a new kind of a technology or a new product which might put my current product out of business, right? So now I have to think about when to develop it. You know, should I cannibalize my own product? Uh, so that's this opportunity cost in a large corporation, I think, that makes the decision fundamentally different than for an independent entrepreneur. Uh, so that's at least one thing I would point to as a difference. Not necessarily as a bad thing, but it's a difference. So when you make the decision on what to do next, you have to take into account what you already have accomplished. And interestingly enough, this is a problem not only for large corporations, it's a problem for very successful entrepreneurs too. Right? So if you have, you know, if you like Pierre Omidyar, you started a company, you, you built it up and it's growing. Uh, now when you want to do the next thing, whatever that next thing is, you have to worry about this baby that you have grown into something. Uh, and expert entrepreneurs have interesting ways to deal with that. Not all of them uh, actually are good at solving that problem. So what they do is sometimes they say, you know what, it is time for me to sell this company or it's time for me to bring someone else to run this company while I become CTO or do develop a whole bunch of other products that have nothing to do with the current one. 
or you know i just uh, resign become chairman of the board and start other companies so the expert entrepreneurs solve the problem by doing other things uh, for the most part but the problem remains i think it is a, it is a fundamental problem it's not a problem that you can just get rid of in a large company but given that you have that problem i'm sure there are lots of things that you can do to allow people to be entrepreneurial within a large corporation uh, and some companies have tried things like creating a venture capital wing where people actually uh, come up with ideas and build it along a little bit and they can present it to the venture capital wing and the company can decide so people have done this but it's not really my area of expertise because i haven't really studied that a lot of the time uh, people do not you know the early stage founding partnership is kind of like the courtship period you know leading to a marriage nobody really wants to write a prenup and so a lot of the founding partners either don't bother to sit down and think through how they will divide the pie whether it is in terms of returns or in terms of responsibilities or in terms of difficult decisions that might come down the road so they just you know they're in this wonderful mood and they want to go you know if there are three of them like like the three musketeers you know one for all and all for one uh, so they go into equal partnerships and professional advisors that i have talked to you know lawyers and accountants who deal with early stage enterprises uh, uh tell me that that's one of the reasons a lot of things a lot of ventures go down the drain not because the market was not there not because there wasn't enough money or the idea wasn't good but because the partners just could not get along after a while and they also tell me that it happens more often when the company is actually growing and doing well when the two different partners or the three different partners have different views of how they want to grow it or what to do next uh, and at that point in time because they have an equal partnership and they didn't bother to you know write down provisions on how to make decisions uh, the decision doesn't get made or the partnership has to be dissolved and people have to start all over again and it becomes uh, very difficult so i would guess that that is definitely one of the mistakes a lot of novice entrepreneurs make the other one is this idea this i can speak to with a little bit of authority and that is uh, this idea that you can predict the future right so you invest lots and lots of time and effort and money in writing a business plan or doing enormous market research and you analyze and analyze and analyze or you do some kind of statistical survey and you think that is how the world is going to go and then you put all your money because it requires that much money to make it so this idea that there is the future is predictable and there is this perfect plan that you can write a priori and then implement uh, i think that is a that is a real uh, dangerous way to think about it and just because of the way we have been teaching entrepreneurship uh, around the world now because people uh, take their cues from the us for the most part on what they teach in their business school classroom it's become almost a de facto way of thinking about entrepreneurship business plan competitions and so people spend enormous amount of time and effort in writing business plans for these business plan competitions and i'm not sure that's the best way to build an entrepreneurial economy especially as the as the expert entrepreneurs would say if you really start believing your own numbers and you think you can actually deliver on this particular plan that you wrote then you are in real trouble uh so i think that would definitely be a huge pitfall for a lot of novice entrepreneurs in fact some of the experienced entrepreneurs actually talked about trying to do that and failing and learning the hard way that the future is not really as predictable as they thought and that is because of that world view in a way right because in a world in which a lot of people act and believe that their action matters there will be more uncertainty in fact the future actually becomes less predictable when people actually start acting in innovative ways so it also is it works both ways it's it is unpredictable because people are doing creative things but also you're you're trying to predict it becomes useless because the way to build a great venture is to be more creative and more active in the way you do things one of the things that came out of my research if you truly buy the idea that this is a way of thinking about the world like the scientific method it's a way of dealing with the world right it's a way of thinking about solving problems in the world then you should be able to solve not only business problems with it so one of the things i started thinking about a lot more as i wrote about my research was 
how would I take this logic, this way of reasoning, and apply it in a non-business setting, like in a social setting, if you will? So uh, I walked into class one day and I asked people, why can't I buy futures contracts in Rwandan prosperity? Right. So why is it that when we try to solve something like poverty or uh, women's progress or uh, education, we seem to think that we need to use a different set of tools than business? So that was one of the questions I had. And I started thinking through, you know, how would an expert entrepreneur actually tackle any of those problems? And, and I gave you the example of Mohammed Yunus already, who is a great example of somebody who thinks exactly like a lot of the expert entrepreneurs that I studied and ended up actually solving a social problem in some ways to a reasonable extent. Of course, there's a lot more work to be done. But at least he showed the one way to solve the problem. And for me, it's, a, it's kind of a... <clears throat> Uh, it, it solves two problems in one in the sense that it also lifts people out of poverty and it helps women do it. It empowers women. So I find that very, very uh, uh, close to my heart, if you will. So if you start looking for people who have solved social problems and in a, in a reasonably big way and you find the same kind of thinking, then it begs the question, uh, as to why we would not use business tools, why would we not use entrepreneurial thinking to solve some of those problems. And that line of thought has led me to an interesting problem that I want to this uh, pose. And that is because a lot of entrepreneurs in the social sector think like entrepreneurs in the for-profit sector, but somehow the funding part of it is so different that it makes the social sector problems very different and difficult. And so one of the things I want to think about is what would have to change in the way we fund problems in the social sector uh, so that entrepreneurial thinking can actually do the kind of uh, development that has, that's been made possible in the for-profit sector in places like India and China. So that's one of the questions that I want to leave people with to think about what would it take uh, to create something that is equivalent to all the different kinds of credit markets uh, and innovative financial instruments that we see in the for-profit sector. I know this is a really bad time to talk about innovative financial <laughs> instruments, but I also think it's a great time for that very same reason that the same innovative uh, mindset that you have in the financial sector, if you could actually take it over to the social sector, I think something, some interesting things can uh, happen. And so I do want to give you just one example or maybe two on that because it's close to my heart and you can decide what to do with it. Um, uh, one example I have is this company called Lumni, uh, which has come up with a venture capital model for funding education in Latin America. Uh, Another uh, instrument that I'm looking at is uh, a fixed income instrument to fund education in Pakistan. As I mentioned, these are uh, education issues are kind of close to my heart. What I want to talk about is the innovations in funding that are available in the for-profit sector that are not available in the social sector, and not even innovations. Um, things that were innovations once upon a time, but things that we take for granted now. They're just efficient ways of funneling um, resources uh, into particular companies and matching up different investors with different companies. For example, uh, let's think about uh, something like, uh, you know, more fuel efficient cars, right? So one of the ways uh, you think about how do you want to think about buying a fuel efficient car, you can check out all the different models that are there and you can hear people pitch why the electric car would be so much better than the hybrid or uh, you know, natural gas would be even better or you can actually you know, turn on CNBC or uh, uh, on CNN on the technology section or something like that and, and, you, and you can listen to different people pitch you different things and, and then you can take your pick. You can spend a little bit more time and do some more analysis or research if you want and you can say here's the kind of car I want to buy. You can also think through which, uh, which car company you want to invest in. 
but there's no channel that I can turn on and hear, you know, two uh, guys from the Congo say, uh, talk to me about how they are going to solve the illiteracy problem in the Congo. And I think through which one do I want to actually back and go home, do a little bit of research, and then a couple of clicks on the computer, and I send the money to that one. We never think about social sector problems in the same way. That's the kind of thing I mean. And let's say one of those two guys in the Congo has a really cool way of solving the illiteracy problem in such a way that the problem stays solved and uh, you know it, it creates a financially self-sustaining model. Uh, there's no way we can just simply create a franchise of 1,200 of those kinds of schools that spread all over Africa or we can import into Brazil. Uh, we don't think about social sector problems though, that way and we don't have any of the channels, uh, the infrastructure that exists that allow entrepreneurs to not just build ventures but to grow them and to spread them out uh, and to create variations through competition things like that. So a lot of those things, and most of us will recognize those as market mechanisms. Right? They don't exist uh, in the social world. It's like really good, smart people reinvent the wheel all the time in the social sector. So my question really is that the essence of entrepreneurial thinking exists on the side of entrepreneurs building ventures in the social sector but it seems to be very much lacking on the funding side. And that's where I think I would like to do some work. And some of my colleagues and I are beginning to work on it. And we call this markets in human hope. I just wanted to mention that because I want to leave like uh, everything that I have talked about here on a what to do next problem. And I think for those of us interested in innovative uh, ideas in business and especially uh, the logic of entrepreneurs, uh, that is going to be for me, I think, the next frontier to think through how do we bring entrepreneurial thinking to the funding side of the social sector. Uh, lots of good stuff are happening on the ground, both on the entrepreneur side, that is the venture building side and the funding side. But I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities on the funding side for entrepreneurs to get in there uh, and do it better.